time is the canvas on which we paint the art of music. So if time is, is that background on which everything else happens, along which everything else happens, how do we organize all this stuff? There's all kinds of auditory events, auditory objects, hitting our eardrums all the time. Some of them are musical, some of them are noise, some of them are speech, some of them are air conditioning, all sorts of things hitting our ears, and yet we make sense of them. So how do we do that? Some of the questions that I'm going to be addressing in this uh, very short presentation are about how only addressing sequential information and tempo and temporal order perception, whether there are any trade-offs or any interactions between time, pitch, timbre, and dynamics. What's the difference between primitive and schema-based organization? Then looking at tabla rhythms through this lens of auditory scene analysis. And then looking at performance strategies that musicians, tabla players actually use, especially at different speeds. Now the auditory system is a fantastic perceiver of patterns, a great sorter of acoustic stimuli, all the way from the ear to the brain and beyond. And the seminal work that came out in 1990 by Al Bregman, Perceptual <coughs> Auditory Scene Analysis, the Perceptual Organization of Sound, has now become sort of almost a biblical for people who are working in the field of computation and artificial intelligence and trying to do clever things with sound computationally. But what was this all about? What he was really interested in was this very basic problem of what makes certain sounds group together. What is it about certain sounds that make them seem to belong together? Certain sounds seem to not belong together. And how does that influence the perception of melody, rhythm, speech, and all other auditory phenomena? So if we lay out all these objects a long time, and we give them perhaps another axis, pitch, and some other colors and so on to, donate, to denote uh, intensity or timbre differences. So now we have a whole lot of things happening there. We have pitch differences going a long time, we have timbre differences, loudness differences, duration differences, and so on. So all of these things are happening both simultaneously and sequentially. The simultaneous dimension, the vertical one, would give us things like harmony. The, the sequential dimension, the horizontal one, would give us things like rhythm and melody. This is one of the famous experiments that everybody cites of Al Bregman's, where he took six tones, three high, three low, into the lead. And when he played them at a slow speed, you could hear the correct order. I have to step out of this because I have technology issues. You could hear them correctly at a slow speed, but simply by changing tempo, simply by changing tempo, the perception changed. perceived as a sequence of six slow tones became perceived as three quick, a sequence of three tones overlapping with each other perceptually. So just tempo alone made that happen. So tempo can affect your perception of melody, but it's sort of a symmetrical question because it's those pitch relationships between those tones that also affected this. So time affects pitch relations, and pitch relations affect time. Now, I was very fascinated by this work when I was a graduate student, and I took it further and looked at timbre, because timbre is one of those very complex dimensions of sound that everyone is scared of, and, is, and it's a very difficult to quantify element of sound. So by narrowing it down to just spectral centroid, spectral center of gravity, I was able to show that even that that just differences in spectral centroid can cause this kind of a segregation, this kind of a grouping. Not enough time to play all the examples, so I'm going to go on. This example I will play you, 
because it affects both the rhythm and the tempo. This example is of a phenomenon that we call temporal coherence. And this gallop type of a rhythm, ABA, so it's ABA, 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 like a little gallop. And depending on the pitch relationship between the A and the B and the timbre relationship between the A and the B, you can cause this to perceptually split into a sequence of A's or a sequence of B's. And uh, again, I did this experiment with Al Bregman later as, as a postdoc in his lab. So the neutral. There's no difference there. Now I make a difference in tamper. So the moment there's a difference in tamper, that gallop is lost. So from being ta da ta da ta da ta da, it becomes ta 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 ta. One at a slow rate and one at a fast rate. So again, tamper differences. <coughs> have made a difference to the perception of both the rhythm, because we lost the gallop, and to the tempo, because we suddenly felt the tempo going down by half. So all of this to tell you that auditory scene analysis and all of this basic work with some of the basic dimensions of sound, pitch, timbre, loudness is also a factor, duration is also a factor, these can influence how we perceive rhythm and timing in music. These are some of the criteria that have been codified, that fundamental frequency differences related to pitch, spectral frequency, spectral shape, centroid, and so on related to timbre. The proximity of the sounds, if they're near enough and if they're quick enough, will also have a bearing on this kind of grouping and segregation, intensity differences, and spatial location differences. So tempo affects the perception of pitch and timbre relations, and pitch and timbre relations affect the perception of tempo and the perception of temporal order, because in some of these examples, you cannot tell what came first. So this delta pitch, delta timbre, delta tempo, since we don't always have um, just uni unilateral dimensions to define these, these differences have been leveraged strategically through the centuries by musicians. We have examples from Johann Sebastian Bach, the entire Baroque period, where they use pitch differences at high speeds to create the illusion of polyphony of multiple lines. We have Schoenberg, one of the composers of the 20th century, who used timbre as an organizing principle, getting away from the hegemony of pitch. Then the minimalists, like Steve Reich, who also made lots of music using those timbre differences. In Indian music, the chikari string instruments, the sitar, the sarod, use timbre differences to create both accompaniment for themselves as well as melodic interludes using those timbre differences and the tabla. Now this instrument, this percussion stalwart of the Indian Hindustani repertoire is almost entirely based on, on differences of timbre. The tabla is a, is a pair of tuned drums, very special drums that have been studied uh, by many physicists for their particular qualities. They have um, membranes and then another, another annular membrane on top of the basic membrane and then a loading on the top, sit, place centric for the right hand dr drum, the dhyaya, and a little eccentric for the baya, the left hand drum. And these special placements and the thickness, the tension, and the diameter, etc., give each drum a particular pitch, a particular range of timbres, and the the baya, the left hand, because of its eccentric placement, also allows for glissandi to be played on the on the left drum. So the kinds of sounds we can produce on the tabla, we call them bowls. We call them bolts, they are onomatopoeic words, they are the word itself defines what it sounds like. So there are words like pinta, te. Never mind, it's a, so a ghe sounds like a ghe, a ke sounds like a ke. Some are resonant sounds, some are damped sounds. 
And there are words that we play on the right-hand drum. There are words that we play on the left-hand drum. And then there are words that we play together. So I'm calling these simple boats and compound boats. They're not simple by any means in terms of their spectrum or anything like that, but simple for the sake of being on one drum and compound if they are on both the drums. So we have these composite bowls, and I'll give you an example of a gay. So that's the left hand, the bass drum, with a slight glitz on the one end. Ta on the right hand drum. And when we play it together, we get the tha. Now again, in, C, in our auditory scene analysis, this kind of a bowl, we would call it chimerical bowl, because it doesn't really exist as a fused sound. We have put it together and called it one thing, even though it's actually two different things that we are playing together. So tabla rhythms have some special features. We've been talking about pulse and beat and so on, and very often that's uh, identified with matra and tabla rhythms. There's other words like vibhag for sections, avartans for a complete repetition of a cycle, for a completion of a cycle. And some other features of the rhythms are that we have very long cycles. After hearing about 128 asul, I'm not sure <laughs> that takes the cake, but we do have some very long cycles. Odd numbers are very common. Then we also have tap patterns to define some of the uh, salient points in the pattern. The bold patterns, which give the teka and vari variations that we play. So the teka is only the basic skeleton and then we take off from it and have variations within a rhythm. Cadences are very important in tabla rhythms as well. Cadences are what happen towards the end of a section. So things like a tihai, where you play a little phrase three times to indicate that you're now ending that section and, and coming to a new section. Or to show the ama, is to show that you're now reaching the sum, the, the beginning point of the cycle again. Here's a visual illustration of this concept. So this rhythm uh, depicted here is the, is the most commonly used tintal, which is a 16 beat rhythm. So four bars, if you can call them, or four beats. We have dha, din, din, dha, 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 dha, din, din, dha. So each of those four sections is called a vibhag. And that entire 16-beat cycle defines an avartan. In some books, it's called an avart. Uh, we call it avardi in, in my uh, gharana. So there are all these words to define these various sections of the rhythm. Now, that one was a fairly symmetrical structure. We also have rhythms like the 10-beat chaptal, where it would be uh, broken into five and five. In fact, two, three, two, three. So tinna, 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 tinna. And again, so the matras are isochronous. That's the point to note here. That although the matras are isochronous and giving a pulse, which you can pick up in, in a beat algorithm, the vibhas are not equal. They are unequal because of this additive aspect of the rhythm. And then the avardhan repeats after 10 beats. The range of tempos, the tempa in Indian music, is quite crazy. If you just look at that range there, from 12 beats a minute to 720 beats a minute, both of these are extremes. Neurophysiologists would be baffled by this, sensory motor theorists are baffled by this, that how can this even exist? because it is very difficult to hold a, a rhythm in your head if two beats are more than five seconds apart. Even more than two seconds apart is hard to hold together. And so this is, is quite unfathomable. And then you get to the high range, especially for instrumental music, where you're playing more than 10 notes in a second. So this vilambit, the very slow to the very fast, a ratio of more than a 60 compared with standard Western music, which is more, more like a ratio of 10. So huge range. This was a chart I found somewhere on the net showing some of the Western tempos with some animal metaphors next to them, which is interesting because we also use animal metaphors very frequently for our rhythms. So there is the slow one is like a, an elephant walking, which is being shown here for the larvo, and the six-beat one is like a frog hopping and so on. But the actual 
ranges of tempo are given in this chart here. So the ati vilambit or the super slow, the ultra slow. Uh, some of the cells are blank here, so they are just a little bit below or a little bit above the adjacent cell. So we can get as low as about 20 beats a minute, and we can get as high, as I said, as 740 beats a minute. In the singing, we can get even lower than that 20. So we can get to 10.4 is given on this chart for the Vilambit layer. So huge range, that's the purpose of, of this chart. An instrumental is always a little bit more than the vocal. So how do we deal with this? Because different things happen, both in, our, in the listener's mind and in the performer's motor apparatus, when you have to deal with such a wide range of speeds. How can you play that fast? How can you hold a rhythm that slow? And what's happening with the listener? And what would happen if you took it to the next step to a machine? Chumra is like the king of the slow tals, and it's been mentioned in the last few days a bunch of times. The pictures of the two people shown here are really the pioneers, the Abdul Bahid Khan and then Amir Khan later, who really used this, this tal and slowed it down so much. Uh, Swarnalata Ji said to get away from the tyranny of the tal and to allow the exploration of the rag in terms of pitch so that the distance between the two beats of that tal are so far apart, you have like five seconds to just explore. And by the time you finish one hour turn, you would have done a nice asthai of your, of your bandish. So it gives you that very, very leisurely pace, almost bordering on an ala. Great for the singer, nightmare for the tabla player. Because how are you going to hold a rhythm like that? If I had to give you an example of this, I would really use up my entire time just saying this tal because it is so slow. So I just say it a bit fast. So it's like din, din, te, re, ke, te, din, din, ta. That ke is optional. Te, re, ke, te, ten, ta, te, re, ke, te, ten, ten, ta, te, re, ke, te. You notice that I was beating my hands and tapping my feet because there's no way for me to keep time otherwise. It is so slow, even at that speed, which is not slow. The real speeds at which this is utilized is way slower than this example. So what do we do with this? Bruno Rep and Haskins has said that this exceeds the thresholds of sensory motor synchronization. You're unable to even hold such, the two limits, the fast and the slow. Sachs has said that they should not hold. This doesn't make sense neurophysiologically. So of course we use tricks. We do the usual subdivision thing, except that we don't make it so overt. Because when you're doing, uh, when you're playing with tempo overtly, you can do doubles, you can do quadruples, you can do halves. Here we do it in a more subtle manner, and so you can keep the time in your head, or you can put a very subtle filler bowl. For example, you do the thin. on the left hand. So it's not intrusive, and you're still maintaining the main accents of the slow tal. But you're doing the fillers just to provide that little punctuation, those markers, to give that little scaffold, which is so necessary to be on track. <coughs> Otherwise, the entire edifice would collapse without a scaffold. Another use here is of those cadences. They play a very vital role. So at the nearest, at the sections, when they're about to end, you have those words, the tirikita. So you have a little bit more action happening, which signifies that, and is again a, a more obvious marker than the ones that are more violent <coughs> periods. So there are little tricks like that that are used, and this, according to the auditory scene analysis framework, would then be examples of schema-based organization. Because here we are relying on knowledge, on strategy, on attention, 
There is the dynamic theory of attending, which again talks about the fact that you cannot really attend beyond those five seconds in this kind of a context. So to allow for that scaffolding, we provide these things. And that, and that knowledge for the singer knowing and the performers sharing that knowledge, it's a shared knowledge. Just as in Indian classical dance, the language of gestures. If you didn't know that, you wouldn't be able to appreciate Bharat Natyam and some of the other classical forms. So in this particular genre, that codification of knowledge that becomes more like a schema-based approach for rhythm. On the other end of the, of the speed spectrum, the fast rates, the truth, here we get into what's called primitive aspects of auditory scene analysis. We shift when you play at very, very fast speeds. The metrical structure shifts from that basic bowl level to the vibhav level. So to the beginnings of the sections, the bigger sections. Or even the entire cycle itself. And the reason that I've suggested is that this is where that perceptual segregation that I've played you some examples of kicks in. Because when you have sped things up so fast, when the sequences are going that fast, the timbre similarities become, or I'm thinking of XM and here, but they become like handles. They just pull out and give you that, again, a scaffold to maintain the rhythm at those fast speeds. These are some spectra that I've uh, got from uh, somewhere showing the dha and the thin, the dha and the ta bowls. So the one on the right, you can see that the compound bowl has a very low uh, um, uh, energy band for the ghe and a higher one for the tonal part of it. So the ghe and the ta make the dha. And then the second one has just the tone for the ta. So <coughs> looking at this and thinking about the spectral centroid phenomenon that I illustrated earlier, we could argue that at those fast rates, what happens is that the spectrum segregates. So that low noise band of the gay starts to look for its fellow gays in the sequence. And that high tonal ta starts to look for the ta's in the sequence, because it's at a different part of the spectrum. And that same phenomenon kicks in of perceptual stream segregation. So here I've tried to show it on the uh, bottom. It's that sort of a, like a spectrographic view. So if those big thick bands are the gays and the thin bands are the tas, so you'd have the gay, 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 and the ta, 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 ta on the top. And this is really what starts to happen when you speed up the tabla rhythms. And because you have this crutch, because players in doing this know that this is going to happen, they can then give their hands a rest by just we're drawing some of the bowls knowing that now the burden of the keeping the meter has shifted from the matra to the vibhav. So basically they have given themselves a period of rest within the vibhav. And that's how they're able to maintain those very quick rhythms. I do have an example of that somewhere. how both these phenomena, the top-down, which is the schema-based, and the bottom-up, which is the more primitive um, version of auditory scene analysis driving from the sensory stimulus itself, both of those work in tandem when we are working with Hindustani classical rhythms on the tabla, and especially as a function of tempo, because different tempos require different strategic interventions by the performer. 
Auditory seed analysis was codified as a science in an analogy with visual scene analysis, where I'm sure you've seen these kinds of contours, where if you know what a triangle looks like and you know what a square looks like, you can figure that there is a square and there's a triangle there, even when in fact there aren't. So knowing that, that knowledge, that schema in your head, allows you to use the sensory information that you have at your disposal, link it up, connect the dots, and come up with these figures. And that can be a huge savings in terms of compression and speed and computation, and in fact things like MP3 players and the other devices all these codecs, have, many of them are based on principles like this. Because when you have sufficient information to get what you really need, you can let go of all the other information which is redundant. And that is what we do as tabla players as well. So at the high speeds, we stop our hands at some of the goals, we give ourselves a rest and yet maintain the illusion of speed. At the low speeds, we insert goals and give ourselves that continuity and yet maintain the illusion of distance. So we are able to do that strategically, knowing that these will function well because of the way the auditory system works. So Hindustani tabla rhythms, if you can't beat them, join them.